Hey everyone, I'm Chris Harkerink, and I'm very grateful that you're taking the time to watch this keynote. And I know that a lot of stuff is going on in the world right now, and we're all going through our own things in our own ways. So I thank you for taking the time. And today I'm going to talk to you about the social model of research in accessibility. And a bit of background about me, I've been in open science since 2012 for quite a while, but I definitely don't know everything and I keep on learning. And I think this is also part of that process is that I have kept on learning and I keep getting inspired by different areas within and outside of open science. And today I wanna to talk to you about one of the things I've been thinking about, and that's through the social model of disability and how that inspires the way I look at research accessibility and inaccessibility in the hopes that you might get something valuable from it as well. So to start off, I want to share that I've been called the Bernie Sanders of open science and I sort of feel like that is a quite the compliment because uh, I think that Bernie has quite some good statements. Uh, okay, maybe I'm not as old as him. Sometimes I might be as grumpy, uh, but I definitely think that he raises a valid point that uh, the system that we live in has deep, deep consequences on people's individual lives. And I think these three statements very much summarize about research accessibility, the things that we still need to do. We need very bold action. We need a movement, not just techno solutionism, and we need to do much, much more. So today I'll be talking about one of the issues in society and how that intersects with research and how that can inspire how we think about research accessibility. And that is, as I said, the social model of disability. And the social model of disability has been around since the 80s, but I, I must admit that I didn't know about it until quite recently. And I think it's a very powerful tool to think about how society is constructed. And I don't want to speak for disabled people, so I'll share a video with you and so that you can see how they experience it and how they explain it. I always felt being a disabled person was a problem. After learning about social model, it challenged me to look at disability completely differently. I myself were able, was able to gain some confidence and um, self-esteem. Social model basically says we are people with impairments, and those impairments clearly have an impact on how we live our lives. But the impairments are not the things which disable us. I'm disabled by the world around me, and if the world was more accessible, I would be less disabled, and then I would just be left with my impairment, i.e. what doesn't work. It's not that my legs don't work that's disabling me, it's the fact that if I want to, you know, if I'm on a flat surface, I can wheel around fine, I'm wonderfully happy. It's only when I come up to a flight of stairs. As a wheelchair user, you have a slightly easier job of explaining the social model. Whereas if you're trying to explain the less physical barriers, it's much harder. There's barriers <laughs> everywhere in life to do with how we communicate. Uh, to do with people's attitudes. Discovering the social model actually was a massive liberation on another level. Yeah, I was being treated differently, and no, it wasn't me being deficient. It was everybody else's social anxieties that were being projected onto me. The blame for you not fitting in is no longer on your shoulders. Suddenly, my disability is out there and not in here. It was what made me realise uh, that I was something beyond the thing that other people thought I was. It's a real liberating thing, but it also means you can change it. We can say to the world, look, you must put a lift in this building. You must make sure that the signage is readable for people with visual impairments. If you want that equality to be real, you've really got to then tackle the inequality people are experiencing in schools, in workplaces, with transport. The main reason that the social model, I think, is important to disabled people is that it allows us to be a community. You achieve a, a whole lot more as a group. As long as we, as disabled people, make sure that our voices are heard and that all those people that support us also have their voices heard, I think, 
I think we will get there. I hope that Scope is doing work that will help disabled people to become prouder of who we are, pushing boundaries around who can be included and where. Come the glorious day if it ever came what, 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 where all the barriers went, you know. We'd just be people with impairment. We, we wouldn't be disabled people uh, anymore. So that short video, I think, goes a very long way in explaining the social model of disability and also has the, the power of showcasing what it means to, to actual people. And summarizing it, it's this idea of that people are disabled by barriers in society. And we can think about this within research accessibility and ableism in academia very specifically. But today, I want to focus on how we can take a lesson from this model, take inspiration from this model, and apply it in a totally different area. And Taking that step from, from how, how does disability or how, how, does, how do disabled people and software relate, it's, it's quite straightforward. I think we, we see it quite a lot in the sense that uh, we, we have web standards for accessibility where we try to make sure that the web is accessible to everyone and that it's not exclusive in that sense. because these barriers to be able to consume on the web can have great, great consequences. And that's already a step to software. But then, of course, we need to think about or what I want you uh, want to inspire you to think about is how does it relate to research accessibility? And the idea really behind this social model is that we construct spaces with barriers that prevent people from participating. And why does this happen? Because we construct the spaces for a specific type of person, the default. The default often in, uh, in a lot of spaces is still a man, often still white, and often also um, cis in the sense that they identify with the gender that they were ascribed when they were born. And really, this, the, the idea here is also that barriers are not just socially constructed, but they also prevent people from fulfilling their full potential. So that when we construct these spaces with these barriers, we're actually creating very large limitations on, on people who are not the default. And I think that's a very important part where, where we have to think about within research uh, accessibility or more even in inaccessibility. And we can start applying this within, say, for example, really straightforward research accessibility in the form of open access, where we previously had pay to read with paywalls, that's one barrier, and we see that we're shifting over the course of these past few decades more towards, or at least that that's what's surviving, this pay-to-publish model with uh, article processing fees. And what we see is that we're sort of going from one barrier, we construct the system where the financially, uh, financially well-off can pay to access knowledge, we're moving towards a system where the financially well-off can pay to publish knowledge. And we, we can ask ourselves, how does this prevent people from fulfilling their full potential? And I think for me, I, I, it's, it's quite straightforward from this model, if we take this lens to the issue, that uh, this is suboptimal. Because what we're doing is we're actually just moving barriers instead of removing them, instead of deconstructing them. So even though we had we had a we we eliminated one barrier, we now have another one. And the question is really, is it even necessary? Because if we start thinking about this and from this social model of research and inaccessibility, we actually see that there were options all along that would have been much preferable. And I must admit that I previously was very much in favor of the pay to publish model, but this really helped to crystallize 
this, this lens helped to crystallize what is wrong with this, uh, with this pay to publish model. Uh, because we always had this option of green open access or diamond open access. Green open access where people deposit their articles in repositories or diamond open access where the author never has to pay for any publication because the costs are borne by people who run the journal uh, or members of the journal. So in that sense, we see that if we go with green or diamond open access, we're actually eliminating barriers. And from this social model, we can see that eliminating barriers is much better than just moving barriers because it limits potential. Um, and it would have led to us preferring a pay to publish uh, much more clearly. And I think there is a big, big thing within open source where we always think that because the code is free, it's freely available, there are no barriers. And there is a big, big uh, but there because that assumes that everybody who can read the code can also participate in this process. How do we construct these spaces in which we actually uh, create software? And a friend of mine uh, who worked on an open source project previously would end up, as you see in this tweet here, uh, be reviewed by random people uh, who would then make her feel like there are barriers to contributing to open source. And she's a fantastic programmer, so this is really limiting her potential in that sense. So what can we do if we, for example, uh, in research software, open source software, but also just in research in general, I think there's this, this aspect of where we have to ask, what barriers are we creating for people and what barriers are other people creating for people? So it's very important to invite people in, create these, these spaces where people feel able to actually say, hey, you know, this is a barrier for me, or this is limiting me within this space, so that, uh, that we can better understand how to help them fulfill their potential, which ultimately is also good for us and the project that we're working on. But also, just from a human perspective, it's, it's very helpful to do so. But the, the flip side of that also means is that we need to keep having this dialogue. We need to keep having this dialogue as situations change, as society develops, and as our project develops, how these barriers keep shifting. It's not a one solution. We remove one barrier and then we're done. It might actually change and that at some point, what used to be barrier free has new barriers. So we need to keep these dialogues going and really we need to invite people in to have these dialogues because just opening stuff up isn't accessible. Uh, we need to really understand where barriers come from to make things truly open. And that also means that we need to get toxic people out of these spaces because Toxic people create barriers, even though you might not, they might not be part of a project in the, in the core team sense or in the sense of that they organize things, but they can, can become a barrier for other people. So it's very important to think about how do you prevent other people from becoming a barrier to others. And codes of conduct are very important with this, but it needs to be thought through how do you how do you utilize these and how do you actually create and curate this community to be barrier free? How do you socially construct the space in which you try to uh, make research accessible? And that doesn't just happen at the publication stage, that happens throughout all stages. So a starter kit is really for research uh, accessibility is to think about what could be barriers and that doesn't just mean sitting down in an armchair and asking yourself what you experience as barriers, um, but also to listen to people and to ask people what they experience and create this space where people can really also voice their concerns and their ideas uh, honestly. And subsequently, if you start in instilling some change, ask yourself, are you moving or removing barriers? Because this is very clearly, if we are just, you know, 
dumping hundreds of thousands of lines of code online, we might actually be open sourcing something, but we're actually making it much more inaccessible. So just opening up information doesn't mean it becomes more accessible. And this is really a, a, an important question also. Moreover, a good question to think through these issues about research accessibility, but also just anything that you do in general is also to ask like, beyond just the immediate effects, what are the longer term effects? What are the second order effects? Uh, and that is a very important because for example, uh, as we saw with, with my friend who shared uh, git commits online, the first effect was, of course it was open source, but the second order effect was that people who, who feel that they, who feel entitled to giving their opinion of somebody's code can make, uh, make that space less inviting. And it also helps us to take another lens to research accessibility. Because very often we're narrowly focused on the end products. But when we think about these second or third order effects, we start thinking about this potential of people. So when we, when we think about how, what barriers limit people from fulfilling their potential, we also start seeing we can go back in time much further to understand some, that the issues already start very early. And one of the things here is also that a lot of people don't fulfill their potential because they're already limited by the opportunities they have and the choices that they have because of these barriers that we socially construct. For example, to just even go into research. So in that sense, when we think about this from the social model perspective, then student debt is already a big, big, big barrier to research accessibility which we rarely talk about within open science. So we can really use this model to also figure out some other issues of research accessibility that, that also require discussion. And I'd be very interested to hear uh, what ideas you also have about this and what other ideas there are. And I think that this Bernie, <laughs> Bernie GIF also very much uh, aligns with that mentality again. And the most important thing with respect to research accessibility is doing something because there are many barriers in our society and I know that it's, it's very difficult to, to reconstruct our social uh, systems, but it's very important that we do something. Just like the climate crisis feels very overwhelming, but just sitting down and doing nothing is not really an option. So even though stuff looks very gloomy, it's the most important thing to keep doing things. So thank you for, for listening to this talk and I look forward to talking with you at the Q&A uh, at the 23, 23 February um, and hearing your questions, your comments, your thoughts. And this is, was my talk. I'm Chris Hartgrink from Liberate Science and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.